Hello, I'm Howie Sheriff, and welcome to another broadcast of the You Call This Yoga Internet TV show. We seek to promote dialogue about all of the limbs of yoga, not just asana, the physical practice. We're seeking to invite you, the viewers and listeners, to participate with our guests from around the country and hopefully soon the world. We've been fortunate so far to bring in guests about adaptive yoga, broga, which is for men, but not exclusively, youth yoga, as well as chair-based yoga. Today, we're including a wonderful host, no, I'm the host, a wonderful guest, Jeevana Hyman, who is the founder and director of Accessible Yoga. Accessible Yoga is a nonprofit organization that seeks to promote the process of providing yoga to people around the world who may not readily have access to it. I've had the pleasure of meeting Jeevana at the most recent Accessible Yoga conference in Santa Barbara, California. Jeevana's been so kind to wake up early and receive my smoke signals in the background so that he can join us, share his history and vision about accessible yoga and some of the wonderful conferences that are coming up. Good morning, Jeevana. Hi, Howie. How are you? Well, I've had a three hour head start, so I'm pretty <laughs> jazzed already. <laughs> yeah, it's so, pretty early there. The sun's just rising. That's beautiful, yes. Uh, so please share with our viewers and listeners some of the history that has brought you, A, into the practice of yoga, and then the idea of accessible yoga as you see it. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be here and to talk about accessible yoga. Um, you know, the, the conference is, um, the accessible yoga conference is kind of a new um, project and it's been really really exciting because it's been really well received we've had two conferences so far both in Santa Barbara over the last two years um, and we have some great ones coming up including one in New York in May May 19th through 21st in New York City um, but I would say where it started for me was when I um, when I was a kid actually my grandmother practiced yoga and I would practice with her so that was an amazing uh, or just incredible luck on my part that she was ahead of her time and um, practicing daily and when she lived with us she would practice and I would like to go and be with her and practice alongside her sometimes uh, and then I went back to yoga when I was in my 20s and um, you know just found it to be so helpful for all of my you know crazy problems of my youth, you know, like just not knowing what to do with all my energy and um, how to focus my life. Mm -hmm. And it just became a real passion for me. Wow. Uh, how old were you when your grandmother moved in and you started practicing with her? So she would come and live with us for a few months at a time since I was, you know, from when I was born. But I remember, you know, probably being around four or five and um, her teaching me a little bit. And mostly I would just watch her, you know. Uh, she was just, uh, she was like a hippie way beyond her years, you know. Was, she was amazing, yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. And could you cite benefits that you experienced when you were a teen and how that may still well, translate to now? Yeah, I mean, I didn't practice during my teen years exactly. What happened was, as I got older, I, I stopped being so open to what she was doing. I went and did my own thing. And then when I was about 20, 21, um, 
I actually, I had some, I was having some problems. I think it was mostly like digestive problems from stress, I think it was, honestly. And mm -hmm. I went, um, I went to this one woman, I was living in California, and I went to a woman for a massage in Berkeley, and turned out she was also a yoga teacher. In fact, she, ironically, she was the teacher of the same style of yoga that my grandmother practiced, integral yoga. Um, and she had pictures of Swami Satchidananda, who was my teacher, and I thought, wow, I know that guy. Um, so that was an amazing experience to kind of come back to the same style of yoga, even. But when I was in my 20s, you know, fi finding yoga then was a great gift, refinding mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. And the benefits were profound because I felt that I didn't have any real direction. Um, I had lots of questions about mostly spiritual questions. I was really going through kind of a existential crisis in those early years, um, trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I was really have, I was on a spiritual quest, and yoga just answered all of my questions. That is a resource for sure. Uh, did you find that yoga was very simpatico with your religious upbringing, or did it create a whole new paradigm? Well, actually, I wasn't really raised with any religion. My parents were kind of very modern and just didn't really, I mean, we're Jewish, but they didn't give me any of that. It was like nothing. And I think I missed it. I think I really wanted some spirituality in my life. And yoga really provided that for me. I mean, what's so beautiful about the yoga teachings is that they have the kind of the technology of spirituality without the, you know, kind of layers of belief that come with religion. So I feel like yoga offered me direct access to spiritual experience and techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I mean, I feel so blessed to have found it at that age and been able to practice all these years. I mean, yoga really is amazing and it goes with any religion. So, I mean, you can have your religion and then practice yoga and it'll just make you deeper into that, into that path, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's an important precept that yoga intends to be an advancement of one's spirituality regardless of religion as opposed to a conflict with religion which seems to be yeah. very prevalent in our American society and even worldwide of, yeah. of this guardedness by religions of their own beliefs and an under acknowledgement yeah. of the parallelism between them. Right. I mean, uh, Honestly, the, I mean, I think religion offers a lot of really great things. You know, it can give people connection with their spirit and it can create community, which is essential for our, you know, health and well-being. But as you say, it can also create a lot of problems because I think ego gets mixed in with the religion and people, you know, believe that their religion is somehow better than another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the problems start. But what yoga does, like I mentioned so beautifully, is just offer these kind of key elements that we find in spirituality that, that sometimes we don't get in religion, actually. Um, you know, like meditation. If, in a way, every religion has some form of meditation. You might call it prayer, mm -hmm. um, but it's basically the same idea as meditation. So I think yoga, yeah, yoga can be used to go deep into whatever, whatever personal path you have, whatever religion you have. Mm hmm. Beautiful. Well, I'm going to invite our viewers and listeners to call in if they're interested at 919-518-9773 for an audio engagement or Computers 2K Voice on your Skype channel. Or you can type into the chat box on our webpage at nissancommunications.com. <coughs> but you have to sign in first. Who is that voice in the background? It's another spiritual advisor, Amnon, who is giving us electronic signals from across the table. That's right, and other signals, whether it be audible or visual on this end. Thank you, Amnon, for hosting. <laughs> Amnon is our, our electronics wizard here. He, he crosses the country for us so that we can reach our viewers and listeners. Okay. Uh, Jamana, tell us about the Integral Center in Santa Barbara and, and how that is building community. Um, 
Yeah, so actually, well, it's not integral. The, the Santa Barbara Yoga Center uh, here in Santa Barbara is um, really a, a traditional yoga studio. It's been here for many years, about 25 years. And it's a, um, a mix of all different styles of yoga. I mean, my background is integral yoga, but this place, we have everyone welcome. And it's it's a great, really very busy community center. Like, like, I, like I mentioned, and as you said, I mean, it builds community because it exists as a physical space where people can come together and practice together. And I, I think community is actually the key to all of this work. I mean, that's what I'm mostly interested in. And all of accessible yoga and the conferences are about bringing people together. Because what I saw is that there really isn't a community of, um, at least not a strong connected community of people who teach adaptive or accessible yoga. And that's what I've been doing for 20 years. And I really wanted to connect with my peers and support them in their work. Yes, and I can appreciate that uh, in that having a nonprofit organization, we feel that we're still figuring out how to build community in the Raleigh, North Carolina region, let alone the state of North Carolina. Yeah. And there's not a lot of models to draw from, which is right. the beauty of this organization. I could speak personally that I attended the conference in October and had the intention of meeting who are my people and how are they processing some of the challenges and journey of bringing yoga to the community because yeah. having a wonderful mission is a great start but sustainability is a perpetual challenge yeah it is a challenge i mean the, the people who do this work who bring yoga to communities that don't have easy access, I think they're, they should be supported. And I think they're doing incredible work. I mean, really, I can, I can tell you the conference started because, you know, I moved from the Bay Area, from San Francisco to Santa Barbara about three and a half years ago. And I, all of a sudden, after having a very strong community there for many years, I was basically on my own here. And I thought, wow, this is how other teachers must, must feel, you know, mm -hmm. especially accessible and adaptive yoga teachers who are out in the world on their own. And then I had, I, I mean, the story I tell people, it's kind of embarrassing, but basically I started to feel jealous of the people, you know, I was new in town and I looked around and I saw other teachers doing what I like to do, like teaching classes that look great and t serving communities. And I was jealous of that. And I thought, wow, that's not very yogic of me mm -hmm. um, to be jealous. So then I thought, well, if I use my yoga and, you know, deal with that feeling, what would I do? And I, and I thought of, do you know Pradipaksha Bhavana? which is a um, teaching from the Yoga Sutras, and it's basically positive thinking. It's turning mm -hmm. you know, negative into positive. And I thought, well, what would be the, the positive reaction to seeing people doing beautiful work? And the, the, the reaction I thought, oh, I should have is to support them mm -hmm. and, to, and to help them you know, and to, to lift them up. So what I did is that's, that's how I thought of the conference, actually, was that I thought I really want to give a platform to those teachers who are out in the world serving uh, these communities that don't currently have access to yoga, because that's what I want to do. And so I basically created the conference as a way to provide a platform for those teachers and bring them together, like you just said, to, to network and support each other, because it is such challenging work. It's not really supported financially by the commercial yoga industry, uh, which is very powerful. Um, so I think we need to find other ways, other structures within yoga within the yoga world to support people who do this kind of really amazing service and i think service is the key word there actually agreed yeah so for the teachers and viewers who are not teachers we welcome your input as to what you're experiencing in terms of accessible yoga teachers do you feel isolated and how can accessible yoga help you. Yeah. Non-teachers, are you feeling isolated out there in the community or world and are seeking ways to practice yoga? We'd love to hear from you and facilitate how you might develop a practice. Because I believe Jivana has a quote relative to having a body and a mind as the primary prerequisites for practicing yoga. Yeah. Would you expand on that a little, Jivana? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> that is my quote I use all the time. If you have a body and a mind, you can do yoga. Because, I mean, I'm not the first one to make that point. But I think the idea is, as you mentioned earlier, that yoga is not just asana, you know, not just the physical practice. Although the asanas are powerful and beautiful, um, there's so much to yoga. It's basically, um, you know, like I said, technology for reducing stress, for connecting with your spirit, for being happy. I mean, it really is, it's like uh, beautiful practices that can help you find happiness in your life. And of course, that happiness is always inside. So that's the kind of the hidden joke about yoga that it leads you back to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say that my, the point I make is that yoga really is for everyone. And I, you know, I've been um, teaching accessible yoga for 20 years. And I started, um, I can tell you about, well, we, we started talking about my past, but I was also an AIDS activist in my early 20s mm -hmm. and late teen years. And I was on the streets, you know, demonstrating like we are now again. Um, but I, I realized at the time that I was getting so much out of yoga and I was on the streets trying to change something, you know, in society. And I realized what I could do best uh, is to focus my energy on bringing yoga to people who need it, to people I was trying to serve. And that was my friends with HIV and AIDS. Um, and so I started teaching yoga for people with HIV and AIDS right after becoming a teacher. Mm -hmm. And those classes expanded to um, other disabilities like multiple sclerosis and heart disease. I got to work with Dean Ornish, who's a really great, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's a medical doctor who created a heart disease reversal program and actually proved that yoga can reverse heart disease, which is still mm -hmm. amazing to me that people aren't talking about that more. Yes. Um, you know, he was a real inspiration to me. And um, anyway, I can't remember the question, but basically, uh, you know, yoga is for everyone. I guess that's the point I was trying to make. And I saw yes. it in my own teaching. Um, over and over again, that often the people who got the most out of yoga were not the ones who were doing some amazing physical pose, but just the people who really tried to practice relaxation techniques and breathing practices and meditation. Beautiful. Well, we're going to take a brief commercial break and share a pearl of wisdom that in concept Jivana shared with me and then I created an interpretation and then we'll discuss after that. Okay. Thank you, Amnon, for rolling the first clip. Have you ever wanted to try a forward fold, but unsure of areas to focus on? Let's explore some important components. I emphasize having the hips higher than the knees. If you're seated, if you're standing, that's already happening. And to start with the idea of an extended or neutral spine. I also like having a prop so that I can rest my hands on something for more stability and let my head drop forward. This isn't easy for me because I have plates and I don't want to fall. So therefore I like to extend, rest my hands, and then round the back See if I can get some grounding on the forearms. Bring my navel up under my front ribs as I breathe and let my head go. This could be plenty for you. So let's explore it for another breath. Good. Then use the hands for grounding Extend the spine upward when you inhale, and then come out of the pose. Try that, see how it feels, and let me know. That was great. I shared the interpretation seated with that intention of being mindful of people with heart disease, because there can be a concern with forward folds and having the head well below the heart, which may disrupt blood pressure. Jivana, what are your thoughts on forward folds for people needing adaptations? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I, my experience with uh, people with heart disease and heart different heart conditions is that they really enjoy 
gentle inversions because it rests the heart if the blood is flowing easily to the brain. So if you can do a forward fold with a gentle inversion involved, um, I think that's useful as long as there, it, it, I think the question is to come into the pose slowly and to just check on how you're feeling the whole time. Um, my issue in forward fold is really is more about lower back just because I think um, lower back issues and um, problems are pervasive in our society. And um, I have lower back issues myself. And I think that um, forward folds can actually, you know, exacerbate the problem or improve it depending on the way you practice. So mm -hmm. I really worry about that a lot, that people are rounding too much in their lower back rather than really learning how to rotate from the hips and um, mm -hmm. stretch the hamstrings. Mm -hmm. know, that's, that's the challenge I see in forward folding. Um, yeah. Yes. And I guess this ego-driven idea that we have to touch our toes for it to be a successful pose. Yeah. <laughs> and that the heels have to be down or the knees can't be bent a little bit. And that there's just the ego to reach the floor as opposed to being with the pose. Yeah, well, that's definitely a problem in forward folding for sure. And, and in all of yoga, but... Um... It's 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 sad. I see I see that a lot because that kind of straining, you know, that people will be straining to touch their toes or to do something in yoga, and you actually once you're straining, you're actually losing the benefit of the pose. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage people to well, first of all, to listen to their body and not listen to me as the teacher. You know what I'm saying? It's like we have to find that balance. I'll give you some ideas about how to do this, but then you listen to your body and do what feels comfortable without any straining um, so that you can get some benefit from the practice. Mm -hmm. I find that even with students that I've been participating with for years, how easy it is for them to forget to breathe and that they're so focused on the physical part that it's easy yeah. to lose that key element, that currency of yoga called yeah. breathing. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the breath in yoga is key for a number of reasons. Um, it helps to tell if you're straining because the breath will also be strained. So I think that's why we focus on the, the breath. Well, that's one of the reasons why we focus on the breath. So if you can keep your breath relaxed as you're practicing, that's a pretty good indicator that you're doing your practice in a relaxed way. But the other reason is that the, the breath will keep your mind focused in the present moment. Because mm -hmm. the breath is always in the present moment. Um, yes. And if your mind is wandering to other things, like what you're going to have for lunch or what you're you know, going to do at work today, then you lose the yoga. Because the yoga is really the, the mental focus. That's the most important element of yoga practice. Um, and the sutras, uh, Patanjali says, effort towards steadiness of mind mm -hmm. is practice. You know, and if you don't, because otherwise, you know, yoga, a forward fold or any asana can become more like exercise if there isn't that mental focus there. Yes. And that's the key distinction that I share with students is, well, you can go to the gym and do a lot of movement and eventually breathe. Yeah. <laughs> However, if we're breathing first and then flowing in whatever way, and it doesn't have to be an extensive flow. Yeah. Then we're practicing, and, yeah. and that's that's a beautiful element. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to invite our listeners and viewers to call in 919-518-9773, questions and comments. Viewers, Computers 2K Voice for Skyping, signing in, and joining us on the chat box. One comment that did come in, is from our recent guest, Lakshmi Volker, mm. who wanted to acknowledge Jivana for the conference because he's really opened the door for the engagement of practitioners and the advancement of accessible yoga. Mm. So there's great appreciation from uh -huh. Lakshmi and others around the world who, who can sense that this is essential and beneficial. So thank you on that. Yeah, thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to 
divert a little bit and acknowledge some of the support that our organization and this show receives. We have sponsors for each show, some several shows. One is a dear friend and local business called Irregardless Cafe and Catering. They also have a venue called The Glenwood. I've had an opportunity to meet with Arthur Gordon, the owner and executive chef, who will be providing our fun and yum good health tip today. Let's move towards that fun and yum good health tip, and then we'll discuss some of the elements that Arthur has mentioned. Hi, I'm Arthur Gordon, owner and executive chef of the Irregardless Cafe, which for 43 years has served a plant-based menu. To make food taste good, I noticed that you have to get at least four of the six essential flavors into the meal. Let me demonstrate. First, we have sweet, which is made from honey, sugar, etc. We have sour, where in this case could be limes, lemons, balsamic vinegar. We have salt, which is sodium chloride. In this case, we have Himalayan sea salt. For bitter, we have an example of broccoli, leafy green vegetables, garlic. These are all bitter. And for umame, we have a shiitake mushroom broth. And the last flavor would be hot peppers. If you can get four of these six into any dish, great. If you get all six in, magnifique. had the luxury of recording this at our beach house, or I should say marsh house, down at the coast, where this is Arthur's laboratory, and we get to sense the back mind of Arthur and his creativeness in the Irregardless Cafe and Catering. So we invite friends who are local or visiting the area to come support our sponsor, who is supporting our mission in bringing yoga to the physically challenged and underserved in the Triangle area of North Carolina. Delicious food. Yes. Amnon's Echoine and last week's guest, Gable, has also eaten there. Giovanna, when you come uh, to North Carolina, <laughs> we'll go to Irregardless. Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> A question came up from one of our listeners and viewers is, what is the difference between accessible yoga and adaptive yoga? It's a very nuanced yeah. question. I'm going yeah. to ponder on that one too while you speak. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I would say there's really no difference. Um, that I, I like the term accessible yoga, and that's what I've been using personally because to me it feels more broad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I definitely serve people with disabilities. That's the focus of my work. But so I like how the word accessible connects to the disability rights movement, which is something that I am very passionate about. I mean, a lot of the work of accessible yoga as an organization is about uh, giving people with disabilities access to these teachings. And that's important because empowering individuals is key um, in the yoga world, but also in the disability rights movement. So that's where I think my interest in the word accessible comes from, is from the disability rights perspective. But I also like that accessible yoga is a very broad term, and it means that we make the teachings available, make them accessible to everyone who's interested. And I feel passionate about that. That's really my life's work, is to try to make these teachings available to everyone who wants them. And I think adaptive yoga is a more... Um, it's a term about, in my mind, that focuses more on the asana portion of yoga, in my mind, and making it adaptations to the practice to make them accessible. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't really see a conflict. I mean, I think it's just um, whichever you prefer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and as you were speaking, I was, I was sensing that concept in a similar way. Accessible yoga could be the umbrella the concept, the spirit, and then adaptive can be the actual practice, mm. the more practice. physical element. 
because yeah. each of us adapts yoga to what can be accessible for us. I can speak that from my disability with arthritis and poor mobility and eventual hip and replacement mm -hmm. and neck prostheses that I have been adapting the yoga process to make it accessible for me. Yeah. But it, I didn't have to do a lot to create the non-physical pathways. It's more yeah. of where is my heart, where is the community that can create support. So I hope that between Jivana and myself, that we've created a little more clarity in the concept of accessible v adaptive. Though it's not really aversive, it's more inclusive. In regards yeah. to the uh, Accessible Yoga Conference that's coming up in May, I believe yeah. it's the 17th to the 19th, am I correct? Yep. No, no. No, nope. 19th to 21st? <laughs> I know, I yeah. did that on purpose. Just testing. <laughs> I'm, I am awake. Yeah. 19th to 21st? That's right. Okay. Yeah. I know I'm going, and, and I'm, I just hadn't looked at the calendar while we're alive. Uh, yeah. Would you say that this conference is only for teachers, or is this something that practitioners or aspiring practitioners can also attend? Yeah. Um, anyone is welcome to attend. I think that um, most of the people who come to our conferences are yoga teachers or people who have been doing yoga for a, a, a pretty good length of time. Um, because what it is is that the, the level of conversation is, is pretty um, intense in terms of you're going to get to spend an hour and a half or two hours with a presenter who is very experienced in their field. And so I try to bring an incredibly diverse group of pre presenters. We actually have 26 presenters in uh, plan for the New York conference uh, and more panelists like you, Howie. Mm. Um, but um, the, uh, the presenters speak on different areas, you know, like uh, yoga for multiple sclerosis or yoga for um, actually one exciting one is um, a woman who co-founded the Deaf Yoga Foundation, and she'll be giving her presentation in sign language, and then we'll have an interpreter speaking uh, to in speaking her presentation uh, to interpret it for the audience. So, mm. um, but I think I mean ever, anyone would enjoy it who's really passionate about yoga, uh, and you can look at uh, our website accessibleyoga.org to see all the presenters. But there's some amazing people: Matthew Sanford, um, who's an inspiring teacher. Um, and Nischula Davy, who's one of my teachers, Diane Bondi from Canada, who's incredible, um, Sherry Clampett, and a lot of other people. I mean, we have an amazing, amazing um, group of presenters. Mm. Well, some other questions have come in through our audience in regards to the conference and the teacher trainings that you and your group are providing. Would you touch yeah. base on how one could gain more information about the teacher trainings and for yeah. both this and the conference, if there are scholarships available and how to address that? Yeah, actually um, today is, um, we're closing our scholarships for the New York conference, but they're available. We offer 20% of um, all registrations as scholarship. So there's, and there are actually still some available. So I would say if we have, people could still uh, apply today or even in the days to come if they haven't all been taken. Um, and you can get that information on the website, accessibleyoga.org. Uh, it's different for trainings because scholarships depend on the location and the host studio uh, where we're having our training. But generally speaking, we are really focused on Financial accessibility, that's one of the main um, aspects of making yoga accessible, is making it affordable. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm very open to scholarships for anything. People should just ask. Mm -hmm. uh, the training is, the, currently the uh, we have a four-day accessible yoga training, which currently I lead, but I'm in the process of training other people to lead it as well. Mm -hmm. And it's an introduction to the world of accessible yoga. I mean, there's a lot... Uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot of ways to adapt the practices and make them accessible um, for all different conditions, all different bodies. 
and also to learn how to bring the other aspects, like you said, the other branches of yoga into a yoga class. Um, and so generally the trainings, um, you know, there's a list on the website. I have, there's a training actually happening in New York right after the conference mm. at the Integral Yoga Institute in New York. Um, but I also um, travel and teach them all over the place. Beautiful. I also learned about being an ambassador for accessible yoga when I was at the conference. Yeah. And that involves participating on a team or possibly more than one team. Could you, um, could you, yeah. could you clarify my misconception or conception? Yeah. yeah there's two, <laughs> well, thank you. There's two different things. So we have an ambassador program and actually the goal is to empower people with yoga. You know, I, it, it's, it's not a selective process. Anyone can be an accessible yoga ambassador. It just means that you are committed to sharing yoga at all. And that's your, you know, especially you're committed to making it accessible. Uh, and if you want to be an accessible yoga ambassador, you just fill out a form that you can find on our website. And then you're connected with our organization and we'll support you. We'll give you materials and you can use our logo and you can go out in the world and share yoga. Now, the next step is if, if you're interested in volunteering with accessible yoga, uh, then you become an active teammate. And we have, I would say, over 40 or 50 active teammates right now serving on about seven different teams. And those teams are all volunteer teams. Um, the whole organization is basically run by volunteers, which is exciting. Um, and they're working on all kinds of things. Some, some teams are focused on the conferences and actually organizing the events. Um, some are helping deal with the scholarships. We have fundraising team raising money for the scholarships. Uh, we have outreach team trying to connect with other communities that are doing this work. And of course, uh, we have advocacy, which is exciting. That's a new group that's, um, that came out of the last conference that's focused on advocating for accessible yoga, which is important, again, in a world where there's a strong commercial yoga um, element and there's not a lot of support and money behind bringing yoga to communities that don't have access. You know, also people who don't have access, not just because of their physical ability, but because of their background, maybe because of where they live. Um, it could be because of poverty or um, just, you know, generally speaking, yoga studios are in wealthier communities. So we really need to be aware of making yoga accessible, not just based on physical ability, but, you know, for every reason. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Uh, our nonprofit organization has committed one of our team members to the communications team for accessible yoga okay. uh, because she's versed in that and, and already doing that for our organization locally. So for yeah. participants that right. are interested, it can only take one or two hours a week of just steady mindful practice in doing service, which helps to perpetuate the process of sharing yoga. It's, it's almost as if you can just turn it on and know that you're part of a community which is there to support you. So I'll invite yeah. teachers as well as non-teachers to explore accessible yoga. Yes, and active teammates can come to the conferences for free. So yeah. you don't even have to apply for a scholarship, really. You just become an active teammate. You serve, like you said, one to two hours a week, and then you get to join us at the conference, which is great. And I'll mention that this year we're planning two conferences. Mm. So we're growing. We have the New York conference, as you mentioned, in May. And then we're planning a conference in San Francisco, um, October uh, 6th through 8th. Ah. Um, and that one is still in the planning stages, but I'm really excited to go back to San Francisco and bring the conference there. Mm. Um, and we're also planning a conference in Europe for 2018. Uh, we're looking at a space outside of Berlin um, for October of 2018. Ah. So that's, that's in the works, yeah. Well, I guess you'll be negotiating with Oktoberfest at the same time. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it'll be our own Oktoberfest. <laughs> well, we're going to take a little break and experience another Jivana inspired pearl of wisdom as interpreted and interpreted by me. Let's 
Have you ever wondered if you're doing a backbend properly or if you've never tried it, what to consider? Some of the key points for me are that I like to have a nice downward extension of my feet facilitated by my hips higher than my knees. If you're standing, that's already happening. If you're seated, consider a cushion. From here, when I sit with a neutral or extended spine, I'll practice dropping my shoulder blades down and back over my back ribs. See if you can release them down and back. Good. I also like to keep my palms facing upward or forward because that helps position the shoulder blades. So let's breathe while we extend our legs and our spine in opposite directions, dropping the shoulder blades. We can add to this by using a rolled up blanket, just happen to have one handy, placing it behind me, scooting my tail back, and seeing if I could wrap my shoulder blades down and around this nice roll. If you're laying down, you can do this under your back, but make sure that there's support for your head. Try that, see how it feels, and let me know. Ah, viewers and listeners, are you relaxing even further? I know that I've been testing our guest by chronically mispronouncing his beautiful first name. <laughs> Jivana. Jivana, yep. So, listeners, if you're trying to reach him, take a moment to practice saying the name. I know, <laughs> I know I'm thinking very hard about it and still uh -huh. stumbling. So thank you for your tolerance and love, Jivana. Uh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you had mentioned the rolled up blanket for folks that are reclining. Do you have any other tips or thoughts about how to foster a subtle or significant backbend? Yeah, I, I think the way I was describing a backbend, uh, it, it, I mean, the use of a blanket was to have it folded so it's flat, but it's elevating the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So if you're practicing you know, on the floor, um, on your abdomen, that you raise the pelvis a little bit so that lengthens that low back again. I just find um, a lot of people pinching in their low back and backward bending. And so it's important to work from that long spine before you do move into a back bend. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think again, what, what you said earlier, I would go back to that about the breath. I think using the breath and backward bending is really useful. Uh, there's a tendency to hold the breath or to really push. Um, those are activating poses and energizing. Um, but you have to be careful to keep them, to practice in a gentle way and keep breathing through them. Um, but yeah, there's there's some beautiful backward bending poses you could do, you know, seated like a cobra. That's my favorite, you know, is to sit in the chair and um, kind of bend forward and then raise up into a, a nice gentle back bend in the upper back. Mm -hmm. Especially those of us that work at a computer so much, you know, we get that tightness in the shoulders and neck and also kyphosis, the rounding in the upper back that comes from age too. Uh, it's really important to do back bends for the upper spine every day. You know, yes. Every day. Yeah. And, and a key element is a back bend isn't just picking one's head off their chest mm -hmm. and crunching the neck in the back, but that yeah. there's a whole flow of the spine to foster that. There's a gentle arcing that comes. And for me, that's why I emphasize elbows and the shoulder blades. Yeah. Because that's roughly where the body can best accommodate that sort of movement. So mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. Also focusing on chest expansion. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's the other side. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like the positive is you focus on moving and opening, expanding the chest. That's giving yourself a back bend. Um, yes. So teachers, uh, please consider how nuanced a back bend could be, especially for folks that have lots of chronic tension. And also for the non-teachers and practitioners, do consider the idea of elements of poses and not having to create some 
broad reaching vision that may create danger or disease. Yeah, actually that elements opposes is a beautiful phrase because I think that's a lot of what happens in accessible and adaptive yoga is you can just take parts of a practice and you know or to oppose and practice that one part. So you don't have to do all the elements together, but break it down and select one one piece and just do that and sometimes that's more accessible. Mhm. Mm that way. And I can appreciate that personally because I've had lots of limits in my ranges of movement, whether it be my neck, my shoulder, my hip, not just being a middle-aged guy, but also because of chronic arthritis and sports injuries and occupational but, you know, issues. <laughs> but that, who, do, who doesn't? You know, as, if you're getting older, then you're going to have to, um, you know, accept that your body's changing. And then it, it's a good thing. But, you know, we're, we're all going to get older and have some some challenges, either dis disease or disability. It's, it's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have these techniques, even if you don't need them right now, you're going to need them eventually. You mm -hmm. know, even if you're very young and healthy, uh, you know, eventually you need to learn how to modify for the days where you don't feel well, or if you have an injury, um, it's really important. Or to help other people, you know, to help other people. Mm -hmm. I have adult children who are dealing with their chronic seated posturing, whether it be studying and on mm -hmm. their laptop or playing games yeah. on their desktop <clears throat> or phones. And I can yeah. already see their issues <sighs> present. Yeah. And I, as a parent, I could only offer so much knowledge. Yeah. They go to their mother more, who fortunately is a yoga teacher too. Uh -huh. And uh, they gain a lot of insights from her because they're used to listening to mom. and uh -huh. <laughs> So whoever your source of knowledge and inspiration is, uh -huh. viewers and listeners, please be gentle with yourself and use props, discretion over valor. Yeah, exactly. You had mentioned uh, Matthew Sanford before, and mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, bring Matthew back into the, the conversation. Uh, for our program, in terms of developing teachers here, we have Matthew's book as a key reading because there's so much that Matthew had to process in terms of his ego and drive and trying to prove things with his yoga, which can often lead to backward movement, not forward mm -hmm. movement, and the path of enlightenment that he's come to appreciate in what does it mean to practice yoga? Yeah, so, yeah. He's he's a uh, a powerful teacher, and I mean, he's really what he's doing is beautifully is using his personal experience to teach from, and that he's inspired me in that way. He talks about the power of our story, and the fact that you know we all have a story, and we all have something to share, and we all have meaning in our lives. You know, and meaning is essential. You know, we all need to feel that we have. A purpose and um, some benefit, something to give others, um, and I think he demonstrates that himself so beautifully. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I, I really. Oh, go uh, ahead. Uh, please finish. Well, I was going to go on and talk about you know one of my passions, which is about empowerment and emp empowering people with yoga, and I think he's he's like the, the ideal example of that. I mean, he's just you see how when you read his book and talk to him, how he's become completely empowered through the practice of yoga meaning that he, empowerment means that he's taken back his own power. You know, he feels that he has what he needs inside. I mean, he's still, you know, a regular guy, but he's basically content. And I think that's, that force of his contentment and happiness is amazing. And it's an amazing lesson. Even though his body has been challenged, his life has been challenged, he still used yoga to find ways to have happiness and peace in his life. Mm -hmm. And that that's what's so powerful about yoga. I mean, I think even... You know, these days where, I mean, it's such a uh, difficult political climate and there's so much, so many people feel stressed and uh, challenged. I, I think it's really important to remember that, you know, we have what we need inside. If we, otherwise we'll be just fall apart, you know, we'll, we'll uh, be of no use to the world if we can't find ways to connect with that peace, that happiness that's inside of us and then go out and serve from that place. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's 
developing, as you said, what is positive and creating an increased focus on the positive that could exist or does exist. Uh, and what I like to think of is, can we change the way we look at a glass and not dwell on what's lacking in the glass, but changing our view a little bit and looking from below and seeing how the water can project up higher and mm. that there actually is something in there to operate it with, but it does take effort. It's, yeah. it's easy to fall into despair. Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's good. It's important to have emotions. I, I think um, we need to clarify that in yoga. You want to feel your feelings, but um, it's not about denial. But at some point you need to find, you know, through, I would say through yoga, you find a way to connect with your own self, you know, and that the teachings tell us that that is a solid rock inside of us that, you know, peace is there inside of us or whatever you want to call it spirit or God, whatever the word is that you like. That's inside of us, and yoga practices are all designed to quiet the mind so we can connect with that place. Mm -hmm. And then when you do that, that is then you're yeah you feel more full, and you can be more effective in the world. So I think to be an activist and to be effective in the world, first you fill yourself, and then you go and serve from that place. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. We'll take a little break now for our third pearl. If you're creating your strand at home, feel free to check our other videos prior to today for the other pearls. And this will be our third for today. Side bends can be really fun, but it's often easy to create kinks in our bend. Consider the idea that we'd like a nice arcing form in our side bend. That's facilitated by strong downward pressure in the trailing leg. So if I'm bending to my right, it's important to have strong left leg and lift my right side so that I don't just kink. Let's practice the idea of strong downward extension, lifting your neutral spine and lifting that leading edge. Good. So you can see it's not easy to tip over without strong support downward. Then we can use a prop such as this stool to rest the arm, draw the elbow down and lift the side body. Good. Keep trying that. And then when you have that sense of lifting the side, if safe, you can just create a little room Lift on the inhale and keep lifting the leading side as you exhale and bend over. Inhale it up, downward pressure on the supporting legs. Good. Let's do one more. Lift the leading edge. Beautiful. I hope you've tried that. See how it felt and will let me know. Well, we've explored forward folds, back mm -hmm. bends, and side bends in what I would say an adaptive way with the intention of creating these poses to be accessible for anyone by themselves or with someone supporting them. Any thoughts, Jivana? No, oh, Jivana. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I love what you said about, um, you know, grounding and feeling that downward movement as you come into the pose. I think that's the key, you know, to uh, really to all practice, all physical practice is to um, really connect with um, balance, finding a balance in each pose. Uh, really, Hatha yoga, you know, Hatha itself means sun, moon. It's about balance. And all the practices are about creating balance in the body. So even in a side bend, Balance isn't necessarily going right and left. Balance can be going to one side, but really feeling balanced in that position. <clears throat> As you said, feeling, feeling the downward movement, which will allow for an upward lift or an extension. So that was beautiful, Howie. Oh, thank you. 
inspired by your recommendations. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Let's go back to a uh, review of the conference and how people can become involved with accessible org accessible yoga. Uh, the conference, May 19th to 21 in New York. Uh -huh. uh, there's an opportunity to have early registration now. And yes. that's Oh, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. I want to make an announcement today, which is that we're going to extend the early bird uh, rate another month because we had set today as the deadline mm -hmm. for the end of our early bird um, discount, but we're going to keep it open for another month so that more people can take advantage of that opportunity. Um, you know, we're still working on getting the word out about the conference. So I want to make sure people who are interested can come and can afford to come mm -hmm. uh, to the conference in New York. Um, I can mention one other way that people can access our conferences is that we're working with uh, Yoga International, which is an amazing online yoga resource. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you're familiar with them, and but they uh, they came and filmed the last conference in Santa Barbara, and they'll be uh, releasing an online accessible yoga conference uh, probably in March. It'll be an online version of the conference that we had in Santa Barbara in September this year or last year. Beautiful. Yes, I, I appreciated their presence there. They were recording, mm -hmm. what is a yogi? Or who is a yogi? Uh -huh. I know I could mess up languaging and names pretty regularly yeah, here. Well, well, yeah, what a yogi looks like. Well, what a yogi looks uh, like. Which is the beautiful work of the Yoga and Body Image Coalition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, they filmed most of the sessions. Um, and so that'll be a great resource for people who can't come to one of the conferences in person. Although, of course, I, I hope people will still come to the conferences because that personal connection is so powerful uh, to be in a room of people who are doing what you're doing and who support you and are positive. It's, there's nothing like it. I mean, it really fills me up personally mm -hmm. uh, to have that community. It's, it's made it's a huge difference in my life um, to know and to meet all these amazing people out there who are serving in the name of yoga. It makes me so, it makes me more motivated to do the work, actually. Yes, it's, yeah. it's this compounding of spirit and passion that is very fueling. Uh, when I was at the conference, I really felt at home and could appreciate the challenges that individuals have out in the community where it feels mm -hmm. that even the studios are not necessarily walking the same walk that they're walking because as a studio there's also a business element or whether you're a sole practitioner and teacher there's still a business element yeah it's, oh. it is challenging it's challenging it's a perpetual but. process here here in raleigh we have an event called yoga fest nc which is our regional and hopefully statewide gathering of yogis and practitioners and businesses to support a our mission, which is bringing yoga to the physically challenged and underserved, as well as a beautiful trade show where the public and teachers can come together. Our yeah, event right. is April 8th, and we encourage folks to go to our Facebook page, You Call This Yoga, where event information exists. We have our early bird registration going on now for several more days and we right. invite you to explore that uh, we have openings for people to receive scholarships for the curious or those that may not have practiced much and want to come back to yoga or learn more uh, it could be a financial situation it could be one that you don't even know what yoga is so we welcome that if you'll reach out to us at uh, youcallthisyoga.org website and just check in with us about Yoga Fest NC on April 8th. If you'll go to the accessibleyoga.org website for the May 19th to 21 and the developing October 6th to 8th, did I remember correctly? Yes, exactly. Great. <laughs> So is this also when the Hardly Strictly Bluegrass Festival is happening, too? Because <laughs> I was looking to go to that, and, oh, I think really? it, and I think it might be there in, in Golden Gate Park that week oh, or wow. the week next. 
So we'll There's see about it. There's always something. There's always something going on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I'd like to thank our sponsor for this week, Irregardless Cafe and Catering, and the Glenwood, a catering venue. We welcome your rating of the show on the NissanCommunications.com website. And if you have any feedback, recommendations for guests, and a desire to reach Jivana, that please reach out to him via the AccessibleYoga.org website. Jeevana, any other thoughts before we close? Uh, I just want to thank you for doing this and for helping to spread the word about accessible yoga and that, you know, yoga is really available to everyone. Uh, I hope that, um, you know, you have great success with this show and with all of your work. It's really beautiful what you're doing, Howie. Well, thank you. I feel supported and part of a beautiful team now. So thank you for your work, too. It's a mutual yeah. love society. It is. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Namaste to all. Namaste, namaste, namaste. You're tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.